the first question is, can we confirm a higher divergence in the inverted regions, the flipped regions, relative to the collinear regions that are not flipped? So this is what Carlos Machado had originally shown. So we did this, this was still collaborative with Carlos and that. This is showing on the x-axis, this is positioned along one chromosome, this is the second chromosome. So this is, this is the telomere gap, that's the centromere gap. These bars here show where the inversion is. So the inversion goes from here to here. The distinction is almost to zero. And on the y-axis, this is how different the two species are. So it's the fraction of bases that are consistently different. So you see, when you're far from the inversion, there's no difference. Far from the inversion, there's no difference. When you're in the inversion, there's a lot of difference. We'll come back to these ones in just a minute. I'll show you why I'm going to show this as well. So it looks like the inverted regions, on average, have more differences between the species. This is using the targeted sequencing. We see the same pattern in the published genome sequences. That again, more sequence difference in the inverted region is the same plot than the outside. This is showing another chromosome that does not have an inversion. Notice it never gets very high. So this, this illustrates that something about the inverted region allows for more difference between the two species. Okay? So the question now is, that is it the inverted region per se, or is it, does it have anything to do with recombination? All we've shown so far is that the inverted region has high divergence, other parts have low. But does it have anything to do with recombination? Well, we can actually examine that because crossovers are not recovered within the inversion, as I said before, but also they're not recovered just outside the inverted region. And this maybe this shows a picture of a chromosome from Sapo Suits here. You notice there's not perfect pairing even just outside the outside the inversion. And therefore, crossovers are suppressed just outside, likely because of this pairing. So we looked at recombination in hybrids. This is now looking at the X chromosome. The yellow parts here are the inverted regions. Right? And the blue are regions that are not inverted. And my student, Lori Stevenson, who just graduated, she looked to see how much recombination you had as you get further and further away from the inversions. And what she found is that you have complete suppression of recombination. So no recombination at all until about two and a half megabases, two and a half million bases away from the inversion. So you see here going from this inverted region up here at a marker of 1.4 megabases, zero recombination. 2.1 megabases, zero recombination. And only at 2.8, you have small, small amounts of recombination. This size, this piece, two and a half million bases within species would experience more than 10% recombination. So this is really different in the hybrids than in the normal species. So if, if this is true, if it's recombination, this is a recombination effect that prevents gene exchange, we should expect to be able to go two and a half million bases outside the inversion and still see high divergence, and then it goes down. That's what we predicted. And in fact, that's exactly what we see. In fact, I couldn't make up data this way. This is <laughs> very close. If you go here, so the inversion starts here at position about nine and a half million. You go to about position seven million, and then it goes down. So that is exactly what you expect to see. If, if, if it's not the inverted region per se, but it's the effect of, the, of stopping crossing over that causes this difference. So stopping crossing over allows the two species to stay different. If there was crossing over, they would not stay different. This is very compelling. Let me show you, this is a slightly more complicated slide. This now is using a lot more data. The, the green is a difference in sequence between two strains of Drosophila pseudo-obscura. Again, the x-axis is position on the chromosome. The y-axis is sequence difference. So this is between two strains of pseudo-obscura. The blue is between pseudo-obscura and Miranda, which you know, don't get the right person, but they're very, very differentiated. Notice there's no particular pattern in the inverted region or outside. It just kind of bobbles around, just bobbles around. But red is the difference between Persimilis and Pseudoscura. Notice this is about two and a half megabases, it's high. In the inversion, it's high. Two and a half megabases is high, and then it jumps down. Again, very compelling that it's the effect of crossing over that makes these two species different. So this suggests it's not just the inversions, but it's specifically the crossing over effects of the inversions. And it's specifically the Pseudoscura and Persimilis inversions. So, then we've answered that we do see the higher divergence in inverted regions. The domain of influence matches the combination of effects of inverted. So how do the patterns observed between species differ from those observed within species? I showed you a little bit of that. Now we actually have an interesting system where we can study this. We have a matching intraspecies within species and interspecies between species inversion difference. So Drosophila pseudobscura and these particular strains of Drosophila persimilis called sex ratio have the same arrangement on another chromosome. So they have the same inversion type. Whereas the normal Drosophila persimilis is different. So what we can do is we can compare Persimilis to this inverted Persimilis, where it's the same species, but there's an inversion. Now we can compare Persimilis to Pseudobscura, where it's a different species, but it's the same inversion. 
This is a very nice study where we can look at this. What we might we find? Well, we might find, sorry, I labeled all the regions of the chromosomes. A is as far outside the inversion. B is just outside it. C is just inside it. And D is in the middle. These are the four regions there. We might expect that A would be less than B. The difference between, say, Lysimilis uh, and the other Lysimilis might be uh, smaller here than here because B is closely linked to the inversion, right? This is right, this is two and a half megabases just outside of the inversion. So we expect differences here to be very low, differences here to be high. Okay. We also might expect D to be less than C. The middle part may have lower difference than the part right near the edge because you can get double crossover because the center of the inversion. This might allow for a little bit of exchange in the middle of the inversion. And in hybrids, we do see about one in 10,000 hybrids have a double crossover. So we'll look at this both in Drosophila pseudoscurid for similis and in Drosophila for similis to the inverted for similis. Between the species, this is pseudoscurid for similis, we find that A is low, but B, C, and D are all very high. But we don't really see a particular difference between any of these. These are all high, this is low. So if you're far outside the inversion, it's low. When you're anywhere near, it is high. This is similar to the slides I showed you before. So all regions near or central within the inversion have high differences. Okay. What about within species? Do you see the same pattern? Within species, we see a very different pattern. Within species, this is high. This region just inside this region is high. But this is low, this is low, and this is low. Everything else is lower. It's very different. So why might that be? Let me show you what this looks like. So in pure species, if, if this is a position along the chromosome, and this is how much difference there is. Between species, it goes up about two and a half degrees and it stays high. Within species, it's only high just inside the inverter region. That's a very unusual pattern. Why might that be? Well, we have a hypothesis. We hypothesize that it's the effect of rare events that cause the difference. So what's going to happen? What reduces this in the middle? What reduces this in the middle is that you have to have these double crossovers. Double crossovers are rare. If you have if double crossovers are rare and hybrids are rare, you have rare times rare. So basically, it almost never happens. So within species, you never get enough double crossovers for it to reduce divergence. Same sort of thing out here. And maybe out here, again, any sort of crossing over in that region is very rare. But since hybrids are also rare, you just don't really get them effective. So within species, you only have these small pockets of high, of high difference. Whereas between species, because hybridization is so much slower, migration rate is so much slower, you get this long uh, piece with all very similar and high divergence. We're going a little bit slower on this, so I'm actually going to skip a couple of slides. Okay. So the punchline for this, we have high divergence in the third region as well to the other regions. The, the part of the chromosome that has this high divergence matches the recombinational effects of the inversion. And we have this unexpected difference within versus between the species. And it, I think it has to do with how frequent hybrids are actually being formed. So what, are, what do we take away from this? This is now the end of the speciation now. What do we take away from this? Well, first, there's strong evidence that these species are distinct because of the effects of the combination, and specifically the combinational effects of these versions of distinguishing. This is very compelling, I think. Now, other thing, and this, is, this sounds silly, but genome sequence data were actually useful. To, that, should, that shouldn't be a surprise, but many of you know that over the course of the last you know, 30 years, there's always been technological advances. There's always this assumption that, oh, now we're going to know everything. You know, oh, look, we've discovered microsatellites. Now we'll know everything. Oh, we, just, we have uh, microarrays. Now we'll know everything. But in this case, actually, I think that we actually do have to know everything. <laughs> so this is the genome sequence data really helped, especially with parent genetic mapping. So the big question that people always ask is how much do, do these regions of restricted recombination allow, allow the genomes to remain distinct? If you add up the sizes of all the inversions and the two and a half megabases on each side, about 40% of the genome is protected between these two species. Which means 60% of the genome just goes back and forth even with a low level of hybridization between these species. So again, this recombinational effects is protecting this 40% and allowing pseudo to be different than the result of percentage. And we think this is potentially a, a somewhat general result in looking at other sorts of uh, systems as well. So that's the end of the speciation part. I'm going to switch gears now a little bit and talk about variation, specifically DNA sequence variation. And specifically, how does the recombination rate uh, affect nucleotide variation? So this, this part of the talk is following up on a very uh, significant study from 1992 from Chip McQuadro, who was my postdoc advisor and his student at the time, David Begun, which was published in Nature. 
What they found is that on this axis is recombination rate, on this axis is how much nucleotide variation, how much DNA sequence variation there is. And they found that in regions with high recombination, there tends to be high nucleotide diversity. Regions with low recombination, there tends to be very low nucleotide diversity. This is diversity within the species, not between species. In contrast, when they look at the, the effect of recombination on difference between species, there is no significant association. That high recombination regions do not have greater difference between species than low recombination. So this is an effect you only see within species and not between species. This paper, by the way, has been cited over 500 times. It's a very uh, seminal paper. They interpreted this result in the context of selective sweeps, which I know many of you have heard of. And specifically, if you look at how recombination affects the nucleotide diversity, imagine you have this gene B, which is neutral, and has two alleles, big B and little B. You have another gene A, and A is mostly big A, but then you have this advantageous mutation to little A. Okay? So little A is good. This one has more offspring in this particular case. Uh, if there's no recombination, as little A spreads, there's no recombination between little A and little B, it'll bring with it little B. That would be a selective sweep, and little b is hitchhiking along with that the spread of little a. In contrast, if you do have a recombination between a and b, then when little a spreads, sometimes it'll be associated with big b, sometimes it'll be associated with little b. So what we got in a quadro suggested is that in regions of low recombination, you lose more variation because of these uh, adaptive mutations spreading through the population and sweeping away all variation. 